Okay, great. So now we have looked at finite difference approximations to the numerical derivative. Okay, so instead of having to take limits and do calculus, we can essentially plug functions into MATLAB and numerically uh, approximate the derivative using finite difference. And we've also used the Taylor series to figure out how good our finite difference schemes are. So I'm just going to recap uh, very briefly. Okay, so we have three different schemes that we're using. We have our forward difference. In our forward difference scheme, we have df dt evaluated at our point t is equal to um, f of t plus delta t minus f of t divided by delta t plus some error, right? It's equal, this exact derivative is equal to our approximation plus an error which is on the order of delta t. This just means that our error is proportional to delta t. And what does that mean if I want to make my error 10 times smaller? I just make delta t 10 times smaller. Super simple, okay? We also had backward difference. Backward difference is super similar. df dt evaluated at our base point t is equal to f of t minus f of t minus delta t. So instead of looking at a point to the right, I look at a point to the left divided by delta t. And I haven't verified this for you, but you can compute the Taylor series of this quantity, plug it in, and you'll find that you get exactly the same order delta t error. Okay. And there's a third uh, differentiation scheme that I want to tell you about called central difference. It's more accurate than both of these. So it's a better scheme in a lot of ways, um, central difference. And I haven't, um, I'm just going to tell you what it is. DFDT at t is approximately equal to the following function. So it's going to be um, f of t plus delta t minus f of t minus delta t divided by 2 delta t. Okay, so this is looking a little bit different. Um, we call this a central difference scheme because our point time is in the middle of t plus delta t and t minus delta t. So I'm looking, um, right, I have my function, and I'm looking not just at a point to the left or to the right, but I'm looking at both of them, and I'm approximating the derivative by the slope of the line connecting these points to the left and to the right, t plus delta t and t minus delta t. Okay, so the central difference might do a better job because it's kind of using the best features of forward difference and backward difference. It's like an average of the two in some sense. And remember, our derivative over-predicted sometimes with forward difference and under-predicted other times. Backward difference had the opposite properties. And so if I average them, maybe I'll have a better, um, a better derivative. And it turns out that that's exactly what happens. This is plus order delta t squared error. And all that means is that if I plugged in the Taylor series of both of these terms and canceled out as many terms as possible, more terms would cancel out, and I'd get the derivative term that I want, plus error terms that start at powers delta t squared and higher. Okay? And this is really great. This means uh, the following. So let's say that I want to make my error 100 times smaller. Okay? I did my plot. I looked at it. It didn't look that great. I need 100 times less error. The way I would do that with forward and backward difference is to divide my delta t by a factor of 100, right? That would make this 100 times proportionally smaller. But with central difference, I just have to divide my delta t by 10 because del 10 squared is 100 times smaller. So if I divide delta t by 10 in central difference, my error goes down by a factor of 100. Okay, so this is huge. This means that I can get way, way better error with central difference and I don't have to take tiny, tiny time steps to do it. Okay, so central difference is great. Um, and you can verify yourself that if you plug in these Taylor series, everything cancels out uh, up to this order. Okay, it's a nice exercise to do. And the final thing I want to do 
in the MATLAB example from a few parts ago, we, we took the derivative of this function f of t equals sine of t. But I used the fact that I knew this function and I just evaluated each of these using the built-in MATLAB function sine. Let's say you don't have a function, but you ins instead you have data. Okay, so this is probably um, one of the more important parts of this lecture is um, usually you're not going to have an exact function that you're trying to take the derivative of, but instead you're going to have a bunch of data points. Okay, so let's say that I have instead I have time one, time two, time three, and so on and so forth, dot, 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 all the way up to time n. And I'm assuming that each of these is spaced delta t apart. So this is kind of a delta t spacing between each of these. Okay, and I have my time axis and my function axis, and I have some function. Maybe it's a sign, maybe it's not. Maybe your boss just emails you some data. And so I have that function evaluated at each of these points, dot, 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 all the way up to my function evaluated at tn. And I'm just going to call these um, f1, f2, f3, f4, dot, 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 all the way up to fn. And of course, fn equals um, my function evaluated at tn. And f4 is my function evaluated at t4, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the scenario that we're likely to find ourselves in, where we don't actually know what f is, but we have a bunch of data. And the great thing about these finite difference derivative schemes is that you can actually compute these derivatives just from these data points f and these data um, times t. Okay, so that's the last thing we're going to do. Okay, good. So we're going to numerically differentiate sine of x on a discrete grid, so we're not going to assume that we know the function, and we're going to compare it with our exact derivative cosine. So there's a little bit of background I have to do. I have to make a vector x equals 0.1 and in increments of 0.1 to 3. Um, maybe instead of x, I'll do time, because we've been doing time. It doesn't matter. You can change all of these t's to x's. You can take derivatives in space. It doesn't matter. Okay. f is equal to sine of t. And I'm going to plot t by f in black. And I'm going to hold on. And I'm going to plot. Um, I'm going to plot t by f. I'm also going to plot it in red x's so that you can see where my actual sample points are. This is really important, OK? And line width, I'm going to make that 2. So let's just plot this, see what we get. OK, so this is just one hump of the sine wave. Um, all of the red x's are my actual data sample points. So we know that there's a sine wave underneath. But for now, we're just acting like our boss emailed us a vector of these red points. These, we just have these red points. We don't know there's a sine wave. And we're going to try to approximate the derivative with this data. OK, great. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute dt. Like we have this data, our boss emailed us t and f, these vectors t and f. And so we're going to first approximate dt equals t of 2 minus t of 1. And if I was being really careful, I would check that this dt doesn't change across this whole vector of time. I'd check that all of these are equal to dt. And if not, we would have to do something a little fancier. But for now, we kind of take our boss's word that these are equal to dt. OK, and I'm going to say that I have um, n points. So I'm going to say that um, n equals the length of f. I have n data points. And I'm going to create a big vector of df dt. So df dt equals a big zeros vector of size n by 1. OK, so I'm going to create a big vector where I'm going to store my derivative. And it's going to be size n by 1 column vector. Good. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to step through our data and we're going to use an approximate derivative at every point. Okay. Now we would like to use central derivative, central difference derivative, because it's the most accurate. But can I use central difference derivative at every single point in time in my vector? 
Right, the answer is no. I can use them in the interior points. I can use central difference at T2 because I have a point to the left and to the right. I can use it at T3 because I have a point to the left and to the right. But I can't use central difference at my leftmost point because I don't have a point you know, at T0. And I can't use central difference at my rightmost point because I don't know my function at Tn plus 1. So on the left boundary, I'm forced to use forward difference. And on the right boundary, I'm forced to use backward difference. And then for every point in the middle, I'm going to use central difference. Okay, it's kind of the best thing I can do in this, in this scenario. Okay, so the left point df dx at my left point at index 1 at time 1 is equal to, I'm just going to literally write down this formula, but I'm going to use my indices. So this is equal to f of 2 minus f of 1. It's f of 2 minus f of 1. That's the same as f of t plus delta t minus f of t for t equals 1. And I'm going to divide this by uh, dt. This is my forward diff. Okay? So for my first leftmost point of my derivative, I have to use forward difference. But for all of the middle points, I can use central difference. So for k equals 2 to n minus 1, so for all of the interior points, I'm going to say df dx, sorry, this should be df dt probably, df dt of my index k, so you can try it for 2, try it for 3, make sure that this makes sense and is actually the right formula. df dt at index k is going to be the central difference formula. So it's my function at k plus 1. So if I'm at index k, I look at f of k plus 1 minus f of k minus 1 divided by 2 delta t minus f of k minus 1 divided by 2 times dt. Okay, Pretty simple, right? I'm just going through all of the interior points. I'm just stepping through and I'm computing the central difference derivative for that point. And then finally, at the rightmost end point, I have to use backwards difference. So df dt at the end point is equal to f of n minus f of n minus 1 divided by dt. This is back. Word. Okay, great. So now I have this approximate numerical derivative, and the last thing we have to do is we're going to take this derivative and we're going to compare it against our cosine, which we know is the exact derivative of sine. Okay? So the last thing we're going to do, we're going to make a new figure, we're going to plot t by cosine of t, and we're going to say this is my true solution. Now, when your boss emails you this data, you're not going to know the true derivative, but we have the benefit of knowing the actual derivative just to compare and see how we're doing. We're going to hold our plot, and then we're going to plot t by df dt in red dashes. And I'll put up a legend saying this is the true derivative and then approximate derivative. OK, good. Let's hope this all goes smoothly. Perfect. And so we see in this plot, it's, they're perfectly overlaying each other. Maybe I'll do the, the true derivative with red x's. So you can, sorry, the approximate derivative is going to have red x's. OK. So you see that our approximate derivative is almost perfectly uh, capturing our true derivative using the central difference scheme. And you can play around with this, so I would encourage you to download this code and actually play around with this. Try having bigger dt's. Try this for coarser dt's, and you'll see that the central difference is still pretty robust to larger dt's. Um, you can zoom in and make your dt's smaller and see that your error gets smaller and smaller. There's all kinds of neat things. Try it for different functions or for some data that, that you have. Okay, thank you.